Good morning and welcome to Tech 259 for Monday, February 1st. Congratulations, we made it through January and we're into February. Um, what we're gonna do today, I think is pretty fun. Uh, we're gonna do some historical context and talk about uh, the evolution of the steam engine. You know, we've been talking about steam cycles and the steam engine for most of the class so far. And uh, we will continue to keep that in our minds because that is the way that most power plants operate is by using some type of steam cycle or something very similar to it. So it makes sense to talk today about the evolution of the steam engine and how it has improved over the past couple of centuries, really. It's been a couple of centuries, believe it or not. So we'll talk about a few different uh, types of steam engines from the past couple of centuries and who developed them and what improvements they made. And we'll talk about how it has improved over a couple of centuries. But there are a couple of problems that come up with that when you try to increase the efficiency of a steam engine. If you're not careful, they can result in some pretty powerful explosions. And we'll talk more about that in uh, a little bit. All right. So to begin with, let's go ahead and give a little bit of historical context to steam engines or the steam cycle. And to do that, I'm going to try to draw these. So I'm going to switch over to the document camera here by sharing my screen. All right. Now you should be able to see me as well as the paper. All right. So I'm going to draw a few pictures on here. Uh, as we talk about the evolution of the steam engine. So like a lot of different pieces of technology, it's pretty difficult to say who invented the steam engine because there wasn't just one person, you know, a few centuries ago who dreamt up this idea of a steam engine. It was a pretty gradual process that goes back uh, at least as far as we know to the Romans and the Ottoman Empire. So that's like a couple of thousand years ago. But they didn't really use it to perform a lot of useful work. You know, they weren't they weren't using it to to pump water or to grind grain. They were mostly using windmills to grind grain. And the idea of a, of a steam engine was was considered, but it wasn't really developed thoroughly until about the late 1600s to the early 1700s. And there were a couple of people who were instrumental in the I don't want to say invention, but the significant improvement of the steam engine. And the first person that we're going to talk about today, his name was Thomas Newcomen. And sometimes this is referred to as the Newcomen steam engine, N-E-W-C-O-M-E-N, -E -E steam engine. And alternatively, sometimes it's called the atmospheric. You'll see why. The atmospheric steam engine. So if I try to draw this, it's easier to draw on the whiteboard in the classroom because I can erase. But if I try to draw this, and I'll try not to make any mistakes. So we have a, it is a piston in a cylinder arrangement. So we have this cylinder. That's what I'm drawing now. And then we have a pipe coming in the bottom with a valve here. This is the symbol for a valve. And then we've also got a pipe connected to the bottom that goes over here with another valve over here. And then up here a little bit, we've got another connection to this cylinder with a valve. And we'll talk about what each of these connections do. And then we've got a piston in this cylinder. So let's say the piston is right here. I'm not really drawing it to scale, okay? So a little bit of uh, uh, exaggeration perhaps in some of the sizes of these things. But here's our piston. And of course, it's gonna move up and down. And then we want to convert this up and down motion into the motion that's going to be useful for us. And uh, what these were originally used for, what these types of steam engines were originally used for, was actually for the mining industry. It was, uh, it was in England, I didn't say, but Thomas Newcomen, he was a, an English guy in the late 1600s to early 1700s. 
And um, he helped design this so that it could be used to pump water out of mines in England. Because of course, usually when you mine, you're digging down underground. And as you dig down underground, that's where the water table is. And so mines have a big problem uh, sometimes, depending on where they're located, with water coming into and flooding the mine. So a lot of times steam engines in the early days were used specifically for pumping water out of mines. So you can kind of imagine, imagine one of those like really old water pumps you see in like American Western films where you've got somebody who's like pumping on a, on a lever and then the water comes out the spigot. So it's kind of like that. You can imagine something like that. And um, so we need to convert this piston up and down motion into the motion for a pump. So I'm not gonna draw the pump because that's beside the point, but we've got some structure right here, all right, like this. This is some type of structure I'm not really trying to draw very accurately. And we've got some lever that connects from the piston to the top of this. And this acts like a fulcrum, like a pivot point. So this is like some lever or bar that's coming across. And then here would be the connection to the water pump. So here's the water pump and we're moving this bar up and down over here. It's going up and down and up and down and it's moving the piston in this pump to pump the water out of the mine. So I'm not gonna concern myself uh, or us with the details of the water pump. We're just focusing on how do we make this lever pivot back and forth like this to pump water out of the mine. All right, so we got this cylinder. We got a piston inside the cylinder. What this bottom pipe with the valve would be, that's where the steam would come in. So this is like a boiler right here. Let's just draw it like a cylinder for right now. So that's like a boiler with water in it. And so you've got steam here. And then of course you have to, you have to convert that water into steam with some type of a, a, a combustion. You're burning something. Uh, could have been coal, could have been wood. Uh, some type of biomass, but you're burning something in this design to turn this water into steam that is going to be useful to the steam engine. So here I'll draw, I'll draw a flame down here. That's my attempt at drawing flames. All right, so this is, oh, you can't see that. So this is the fire that's burning something, whatever's, you know, at hand to heat up this water, turn it into steam, and then this valve can be opened or closed to allow steam to go into the cylinder. And you might think, it would be intuitive to think, that this steam is at high pressure and it's gonna push this piston up. That's actually not really how it worked, surprisingly. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but let me identify what these are first. So this one right here at the bottom of the cylinder, this is just a drain. So this lets the condensed water, which the steam turns into, as well as if there is any steam or gas left, then it allows it to escape down here. And possibly it would go back into this tank right here, possibly. Uh, and then the other really important thing is this connection right here. This is condensing water. So this is probably cold water that is allowed to go into the cylinder. And it's really important because th what this does is it cools down and condenses the steam that is in here. So what really happens, the way this actually works is this valve is opened while these are closed. And when that's opened, then the steam is allowed to flow into the cylinder, but it's not really high pressure steam. You know, we're talking like the 1700, early 1700s. They didn't have the technology to make strong pressure vessels that could withstand high pressures. So this is not really high pressure steam that would push this piston. That's not really how it worked. What would happen is this steam at pretty low pressure would go through this valve and into this cylinder. 
And then what would happen? This valve would be closed. And then this valve with the condensing water would be opened. So you'd have the relatively cold water that would shoot into the cylinder from here. And when that would happen, that would very quickly condense that steam. And when you condense steam by turning it from a gas into a liquid, you actually create a vacuum in here. And by vacuum, I mean a pressure that's less than atmospheric pressure. All right, and you can kind of imagine why that would happen. You, know, you got steam molecules that are bouncing all over the place. You inject some cold water into it. It doesn't take a ton of cold water, just a little bit of, you know, like a few squirts of cold water in here. And you condense that steam into liquid. And when it condenses into liquid, those molecules are no longer bouncing all around and no longer creating as much pressure on the walls of this cylinder. So it results in a lower pressure, in fact, a vacuum, a vacuum pressure inside this cylinder. So what's actually the power stroke where this gets its power is actually the difference in pressure between atmospheric pressure, which is up here and on the top side of the piston, and the vacuum that's created in here when the condensing water shoots in here. All right, so the power stroke of this design is not when the steam comes in here to push the piston up, it's actually when the condensing water shoots in here to condense the steam to create a vacuum in here and then the difference in pressure between the vacuum in here and the atmospheric pressure up on top of the piston actually pushes the piston down. And as it pushes the piston down, the drain valve is opened and that allows the condensed liquid, maybe still a little bit of, of steam and whatever gas is left over to escape out here. And then after that, this is closed, this valve is closed, and the whole process starts again. So now the piston is all the way at the bottom of the cylinder, like down here. And to get the piston up again, you'd actually have to rely on momentum of some flywheel. There'd be, I haven't drawn it, but there'd be some flywheel of sorts over here in the system. And the reason it would go up again, the cylinder would go up, allowing more steam to go in when that valve is opened would actually just be momentum of the system that would draw the piston back up again. And the cycle would repeat over and over and over again continuously, um, but the power stroke is actually when the cold condensing water comes in here, condenses the steam, creates a difference in pressure between inside the cylinder and on top of the piston, all right? Creating a downward force on the piston. All right, so that was the atmospheric steam engine or the Newcomen steam engine. And the thing I want you to note about this is that we are applying steam to this cylinder, thus heating up the cylinder because the steam is hot. And then with every cycle of the piston going up and down, we're shooting this cold water inside this cylinder. So if you think about even like the cylinder walls, you know, these, this would be like a, a thick cylinder wall. So what's happening on each and every cycle of this piston is that we're heating up the entire cylinder and piston arrangement. We're heating it up with hot steam. And then a fraction of a second later, we're cooling it down with cold condensing water. So that's a lot of wasted energy. It's a lot of wasted energy to be heating something up and then cooling it down and then heating it up and then cooling it down and then heating it up and cooling it down again over and over and over again. That's a lot of wasted energy. And that is what someone by the name of James Watt, who you've probably heard of, at least the last name, the Watt, you know, the unit of power. James Watt, um, who was not really a trained engineer. He was kind of like a, an inventor slash scientist who hung around the University of Glasgow for, for a long time. And he actually got paid by the University of Glasgow to design a steam engine for use at the university somewhere. And he recognized that this new common or atmospheric steam engine was really inefficient, really inefficient because this whole system right here had to be heated up and cooled down with every cycle of the piston. And that is not a very efficient way of producing work. And so what he did 
is create a an improvement. So, you know, if you if you read some books or maybe on the internet, some people will tell you that James Watt invented the steam engine. He didn't. He didn't invent the steam engine, but he did make some really significant improvements to the steam engine. So, let's draw that. This is James Watt his steam engine, which was originally designed for the University of Glasgow. Um, and uh, here's what it looked like, if I can try to try to draw this. All right, so we've got a steam boiler. I'll draw that about right here. We've got an inlet on top, or an inlet on the bottom and an outlet on top. And then we've got water here and we're going to heat it and turn it into steam and we've still got the combustion the combustion of the fuel is still what created the steam what turned the water into steam so we still got there's our water pipe we still got the fire down here where we're burning something and that fire is what turned the water into steam and then we've got our steam pipe that comes out on top here and it comes over like this and then this is kind of difficult to draw but there is actually a diverter kind of like a flapper here that can go either up like this or down like this it can divert the steam either down as i've shown it here so the steam can be diverted down or if that little flapper were to pivot down like that the steam would be diverted up like this. So the steam could go into either one of these pipes, top or bottom, depending on the position of that little flapper, the diverter valve. All right, so the steam can either go up on top or down below. And we still have a piston and a cylinder arrangement, so that hasn't changed. James Watt still used a piston and a cylinder arrangement. So here's our piston shown in kind of the intermediate position. So he would still use that piston connected to a water pump of sort. Uh, and here is the other wall, the, the right side wall of our piston or cylinder. So that would come in like this. And then these are our exits or drains and so this has a valve right here that can open and close and this has a valve right here that can open and close all right so we can see we can see one improvement that james watt made right here all right this is one of the two improvements that james watt made to the steam engine this is actually the lesser of the two in terms of significance this one is not as significant as the next thing i'm going to talk about but it is it is important and this is called a double acting piston or a double acting cylinder, either one. You can call it either one. And what that means is that we can apply steam to either side. So now the steam is actually pushing on the cylinder now. So now we've got steam that's a little bit higher pressure than it was in the new Cummins steam engine. And so we've got steam that can actually push the piston up if the steam is applied to this side, or when the piston gets all the way up in the cylinder, we flip that diverter valve, and then the steam is applied to the top side and it pushes the piston down. So this is you know, a big improvement potentially, right? Where now we're the power stroke, we're applying the power stroke to both movements of the piston as it goes up and as it goes down. So a double acting piston or a double acting cylinder uh, means that we're forcing it up and then we're forcing it down and then forcing it up and then forcing it down. So then that repeats over and over and over again. All right. And crucially, it's important to note here, there is no condensing water being shot into this cylinder. We are not condensing the steam inside the cylinder. And that's really important because that was the source of a huge loss in the new Cummins engine. You know, you, you heat up this whole arrangement around here and then you just cool it down again. And then when you admit more steam, a lot of the energy in that newly admitted steam just has to go to heating up the cylinder and the area around the cylinder again. So that was a lot of wasted energy. So in here, 
we do not condense the steam inside the cylinder. Instead, we have the steam that goes out of the cylinder, either from the top or from the bottom, and then they connect. And they go into what you have already seen before, and that is a condenser. So this is known as an external condenser. It's external because it's not inside the cylinder. An external condenser. So we have our condenser. Condenser. And it works very much the same way that modern condensers work. We've got pipes of cold water. I'm only going to draw one for simplicity, but this would be cold water that runs through the pipe. All right, that's supposed to be an arrow. All right, there's cold water running through this pipe. The pipe goes through the condenser, but the steam and this cold water don't mix. So the steam coming down here just condenses on and around the outside, the exterior of this pipe going through the condenser. All right, in a real condenser, you'd have hundreds to thousands of these pipes with cold water going through them. All right, so that condenses this steam into liquid. And then again, like I said before, with the Newcomen engine, they'd probably reuse this. So they might directly connect this over here and there might have to be a pump over here. I'm just not drawing that for simplicity's sake right now, but basically they could reuse this, this water down here. All right, so this is pretty much the, uh, the complete cycle here. Uh, starting from here, we uh, combust or burn something to add heat to this water, turning it into steam. And the steam can be applied either to the top or the bottom of this piston via this diverter valve right here. So our first major improvement that Watt came up with, it's worth writing these down because they're significant. Improvements, number one, was a double acting cylinder or double acting piston. And this meant that we could apply steam to either side of the piston. Not at the same time, we wouldn't want to do that, but one after the other, we can apply piston. We can apply the steam to one side of the piston, then the other side to force it up and down and, and back and forth. All right, so that's our double acting cylinder or double acting piston. And then the other improvement, which is actually more significant, it's kind of hard to believe that it's more significant than this, but this second improvement actually improved the efficiency of the steam engine even more than the double acting cylinder did. And that was called the external condenser. Sometimes it's also called a separate condenser, so either one, but it's an external condenser and that causes the condensation to occur outside of the cylinder, to occur outside the cylinder. We don't want the condensation to be occurring inside the cylinder because then we'd have to heat up this area, this cylinder, each and every time we admit steam and then condense it and then admit more steam. So this external condenser, having this condenser over here and using this apparatus to condense the steam instead of that happening in the cylinder was a really big improvement. In fact, between these two, between these two, this actually approximately doubled the efficiency, about doubled the efficiency of the steam engine compared to the new coming or atmospheric engine. So that's that's huge. You know, doubling the efficiency of something is is enormous. So if you think about that, you could say, well, I could burn the same amount of fuel and get twice as much work out of it, you know, pump twice as much water or whatever I'm doing with that work. 
get twice as much work out of it. Or if I only want to get the same amount of work out of it, then I only need half as much fuel. So that's an enormous improvement. You know, if, uh, if the efficiency of your home's heating system or your car engine was doubled, that would be a huge improvement. That would make a, a big difference to uh, the transportation industry or the heating, ventilating and heating, ventilation and air conditioning industry. All right. So that's uh, kind of a, a brief, a brief synopsis of the evolution of the steam engine. The turbine replacement of the piston actually came later. So it is true that uh, eventually the piston was replaced by the spinning turbine that we've talked about a little bit so far in the first couple of weeks of class. So the turbine is a more efficient design as compared to the piston, largely because the piston continuously spins in one direction. Whereas with a piston, it has some inertia going in, say, one direction, say up, and then you have to actually use some of that steam to overcome that inertia and get it moving in the opposite direction. And then you got to overcome some of that inertia in the, in the downward direction, and you got to get it moving in the upward direction again. So there's some inertia in this piston that you have to overcome. And that's one of the big reasons that, uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that a steam turbine that just spins continuously in one direction, I've showed a picture of a turbine before, um, that's one reason why a turbine is more efficient than a piston. So that was that was much later. Um, that was 50 to 100 years later than James Watt that the turbine became widespread in its use. But uh, that, in a, in a nutshell, that's kind of a brief historical context to the evolution of the steam engine. Um, remember the, I want you to remember some some principles about how the Newcomen engine worked. Uh, what was its power stroke? How did it get its power? How did it do work? And then I definitely want you to know these improvements that James Watt made. And I want you to understand how pretty massive of an improvement that was. All right, so that's a little bit of uh, historical context. That kind of kicked off the Industrial Revolution. Uh, if you remember those dates I was talking about, uh, James Watt, uh, that was in the yeah, mid 1800s, and uh, that that in many ways kind of kicked off the industrial revolution uh, from the latter half of the 1800s to the early part of the 1900s. All right, the next thing I want to talk about today is a little bit of efficiency. All right, and how we can get more efficiency from the steam engine. We just talked about how James Watt improved the efficiency of the steam engine. And then a little bit after him, the steam turbine came along, like I mentioned. So that was an improvement to the efficiency. But if we think about kind of modern steam engine designs, we talked about efficiency last time. And we talked about something called the Carnot efficiency which is really kind of a limit. It's an upper limit on the efficiency. You cannot have a steam, come on, focus. Yeah, the camera sometimes has trouble focusing. Uh, we all do, we all have trouble focusing sometimes. Uh, the Carnot efficiency is kind of a, an upper theoretical limit on the efficiency. And we said that that Carnot efficiency is equal to one minus T low, or you could replace that with T cold. They mean the same thing, the lower temperature. So this is kind of like the, the water going through the condenser divided by T hot. So this is like the temperature of the steam. All right. And this is a pretty simple equation that we have for the upper limit on efficiency, kind of like the Betts limit for wind turbines. You know, it's kind of analogous. The Betts limit is an upper limit on the efficiency of a wind turbine, just like the Carnot efficiency is an upper limit on the efficiency of a steam cycle. You will never ever find a steam cycle that exceeds the Carnot efficiency. All right, so if we think about how can we make steam engines more efficient? Because like I said before, for the same amount of fuel, it'd be great if we could get twice as much work or if we're happy with the amount of work it's producing, let's burn half as much fuel. That'd be awesome. That'd be wonderful. All right. So 
to improve the efficiency, what can we do? What do we want to do? Well, uh, the number one is a constant. Nothing you can do with that. But we have some control over T low or T cold. And we have some control over T hot because maybe we could control the temperature of the cooling water in the condenser. Or maybe we could control the temperature of steam. You know, that's, that's something that maybe we could design a steam system to, uh, to adjust these parameters to have a, a different T low or a different T hot. So if we want to improve our efficiency, we want to make this factor T low divided by T hot as small as possible. We want to make this term as small as possible so that we're subtracting a small number from one. And therefore our efficiency can be as high as possible, right? So if we want to make this number, this, this value T low divided by T hot to be small, let's go ahead and write that. We want T low or T cold divided by T hot to be small. Okay, so that we can subtract this small number from one to get a high efficiency. So to do that, therefore, we want T low to be low. We want it to be really low or cold, you know, e either way is fine. Uh, this is the low temperature reservoir in the steam engine. So it's like the temperature of the cooling water going through the condenser. We want T low to be, we'll say, as low as possible. As low or as small as possible. All right? Simultaneously, if we want this term to be as small as possible, we could also affect this parameter by making T hot as large or as high as possible. So we want T high or T hot to be as high as possible. Because when you increase the denominator, when you're dividing by a larger number, your result, your overall result is smaller, right? So to make this efficiency as large as possible, because we want to be as efficient as possible, we want this term to be as small as possible. And we can make this term smaller either by decreasing T low or making T low as small as possible, or by making T hot or T high as high as possible, or both, ideally both, some combination of these two things. All right, so the next question is, how do we do those? How do we make T low as low as possible? And how do we make T high or T hot as high as possible? That's what we want to do. That's a, a great question. So I think what I'm going to do uh, is uh, let's take a quick break. This is a, a good point for uh, a quick break. So take a few seconds and at least stretch, stretch your arms, uh, do some jumping jacks or some push-ups or something to get your blood flowing again. And then uh, let's come back and I've got some PowerPoint slides that I'm going to share. So take a quick break, pause the video and then come back and we'll talk more about exactly that, how to make T low, low, and how to make T high, high. Welcome back to the second part of this video. In this part of the video, we're gonna talk about how to improve the Carnot efficiency of the system. And we're going to do that by talking about how we can change the parameters of T hot, make it hotter, and T cold, make it colder. All right. Um, and to start talking about that, I want you to actually think about baking brownies when you bake brownies. And if you have some experience baking brownies, you'll know that on the back side of the box where it has the instructions, you'll see that there are high altitude instructions. Like if you're in Denver, Colorado, and you want to bake brownies, you have to follow these high altitude instructions. What you'll notice about those high altitude instructions 
is usually the temperature at which you bake them is higher and the length of time that you bake them is also higher, more time required. Why is that? Why do you have different instructions for high altitude baking? Well, the reason is because at high altitude, you have lower pressure, lower atmospheric pressure, which makes sense because if you think about, you know, when you're in Denver, Colorado, there are fewer atmospheric molecules pressing down on you, you know, from above. And so the pressure on you is lower in Denver than it is, say, uh, in Florida at sea level when there are a lot more molecules of atmosphere pressing down on you and everything else at sea level. So as it turns out, the lower atmospheric pressure in Denver actually results in a lower boiling temperature of water. Water will actually boil at a lower temperature when the atmospheric pressure is reduced or lower. And that kind of makes sense. We'll talk more about boiling in a couple of weeks and we'll talk more about this, but basically boiling requires the creation of these air bubbles. And you've seen this if you've ever boiled anything. You've seen the formation of those air bubbles. Well, for those air bubbles to form, you have something called the vapor pressure of the liquid, and the vapor pressure has to be higher than the atmospheric pressure above it. And so if the atmospheric pressure above it is lower, it's easier for those bubbles to form. So you have a lower boiling temperature when you have lower atmospheric pressure. All right, so if you have a lower boiling temperature, now you're boiling something and it's literally not as hot as if you were boiling something at sea level. So because the boiling temperature is lower, it actually takes more time to cook and you try to compensate that by cooking it for longer and also maybe increasing the temperature of the oven or the stove as well. All right, so keep that in mind. That's closely related to what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to switch over to my slides and we'll start talking about steam systems again. All right, we're going to talk about steam plant efficiency and boiler safety. All right, so as we talked about, the Carnot heat engine efficiency, which is the maximum theoretical efficiency it could have if it had no friction, no losses, and it's perfectly reversible, it's this equation right here. So in order to increase the Carnot efficiency, I can either decrease the low temperature reservoir's temperature, or I can increase the temperature of the high temperature reservoir. This would be like the temperature of the steam, and this would be like the temperature of the cooling water going through the condenser. All right, as a matter of practical considerations, it's usually easier to increase the temperature of something than it is to decrease the temperature of something, just kind of in general, all right? So like if I have my, my cup of coffee right here, it's usually easier, practically speaking, to increase the temperature. I can just set it on something hot, like on top of a fire or on top of a stove, or I can throw it in the microwave or something like that. Uh, if I wanted to cool it down, well, I can do that. Uh, you know, it's a cold day outside today, so I could just put it outside, but that's just kind of lucky because it's a, it's a cold day. Uh, you might say, well, I could just put this inside the refrigerator, which is true, but remember, the refrigerator is a pretty complex system, and that's a, that's a heat pump that's taking the heat from inside the refrigerator and pumping it to outside the refrigerator. So we got to do a lot of work in the process to operate that refrigerator. Much easier just to build a fire or burn something and put this, you know, on top of that. You know, as a matter of complexity of the system, it's a much easier process to produce heat than it is to produce cold. You know, that's an, another way of thinking about it. So it's often easier to increase T hot than it is to decrease T cold. Now, that being said, we're going to try and do both. We're going to do both in a steam system. But uh, just keep in mind, usually it's easier to play around with tea hot than it is to play around with tea cold, just for practical considerations. So let's talk about them individually. First of all, we'll talk about tea hot. We want to increase tea hot, which means we want higher temperature steam. So how can we get higher temperature steam? So remember we talked about the boiling temperature and the effect of atmospheric pressure on the boiling temperature, right? So we wanna get high temperature steam. We wanna get steam that is really hot, all right? 
And we said that as we go to higher elevations, the atmospheric pressure decreases, which decreases the boiling temperature, right? We want to do the opposite. So we want to do something where we get higher temperature steam. So I can go to sea level and I would get a higher boiling temperature, which will result in a little bit higher temperature steam, right? But that's not good enough. We don't want to just go to sea level. We actually want to go to much higher pressures than just atmospheric pressure at sea level. And if we go to much higher pressures, then we can apply heat and eventually we can boil it and it's going to boil at a much higher temperature. So in a nutshell, that's how we do it. We get higher temperature steam by increasing the pressure of the steam system. Uh, so we boil it and we get a higher temperature steam. All right, so we do that by using higher pressure steam systems. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot that's involved in the design of higher temperature and higher pressure steam systems. The boiler itself and all of the piping has to be a lot more robust. You know, if you're designing a boiler to be operated at 600 PSI or 1000 PSI, that boiler is going to look a lot different than a boiler that's designed to operate at atmospheric pressure. The one that's at high pressure is going to be a lot thicker, a lot stronger, a lot more robust than just the one at atmospheric pressure. So this is a potential failure point of the system. Keep that in mind. Uh, we can also use superheaters. We've talked about those in passing kind of before where you can take steam and then you can run it again through the boiler and you can heat it up even more to get the temperature above the boiling temperature and we call those superheaters. And another reason why we want to use higher pressures in the boiler, this is a, another legitimate reason, is because as we have higher pressures, that allows them to expand more inside, say, the turbine. So now we've got higher pressures, those molecules are bouncing around each other, and now it allows more room for them to expand as they go into the turbine. So that's another legitimate reason. It's kind of a secondary reason, but it's it's definitely another reason why we want to use higher pressures. All right, so here is a phase diagram for water. This has pressure, not in a linear scale, but this has pressure on the vertical axis, and this has temperature, again, not in a linear scale, but it's on the horizontal axis. Um, so we have our phases, water is up on top here, and then ice is over here on the left, and water vapor or gas or steam is over here kind of on the bottom right. So what you can see is that as we go from left to right, say along this diagram at atmospheric pressure, 101.3 kilopascals is atmospheric pressure. So as we add heat and increase the temperature, first of all, we increase the temperature of the ice, then we melt the ice into water, then we increase the temperature of the water, and then eventually if we keep adding heat, then we turn it into steam. But if we're still at that same pressure, then that steam is going to be at 100 degrees Celsius, unless we do something else to it, to superheat it. All right, so we are not going to get steam that is greater than 100 degrees Celsius unless we add some more heat to it. We do something else for it, all right? But what can we do to get higher temperature steam? Well, like I said, we can do superheaters and things like that, but also we can just operate the steam system at a higher pressure. So now if I'm say, imagine a horizontal line right here, I'm at a much higher pressure compared to atmospheric pressure. So if I'm at a higher pressure right here, I'm going to be adding heat to my water in the boiler, and then eventually I'm going to boil it right here, but look at this temperature. If I draw a straight line down right here, the temperature is much higher than the boiling temperature at atmospheric pressure. So if I'm at a higher pressure and I boil liquid at that higher pressure, I'm going to make it boil at a higher temperature, All right? So that is how we get a higher tea hot. We simply boil the water at a higher temperature. All right, now let's take a look at tea cold. So we want to decrease tea cold. We want a lower, low temperature reservoir. 
How do we do that? Well, we have to change something in the condenser. The low temperature reservoir is the water that's going through the condenser to condense the steam. So we want to decrease that temperature. Why do we want to decrease that? Well, because that improves our efficiency. How do we improve, how do we decrease the T cold temperature? Well, the way you do that is by doing the opposite of what we just talked about. What we can do is we can decrease the pressure inside the condenser. And if we do that, that's going to decrease the temperature of the condenser, inside the condenser. That's going to decrease that temperature. So for that reason, we want to use condensers that are at a really low pressure, below atmospheric pressure. And so what you actually use in real life, you use something called air ejectors, which are basically just like pumps, not like fans, pumps, that are actually physically pumping air out of the condenser. So you actually want to pump the air out of the condenser so that your condenser operate, operates at a vacuum so that the temperature inside the condenser is lower because we know condensation will occur at a lower temperature when you have a lower pressure condenser. All right, so we'll look at the phase diagram in just a second, just like we did before, and we'll see that again. A few other notes. Like I said, uh, we operate condensers at a vacuum, and uh, it's actually sometimes a problem if you have air leakage into the condenser, that's uh, a, a problem. It reduces the efficiency of the system. So there are different sensors that detect when there's air leakage into the condenser. And when you do have that, you want to fix it. You want to make your condenser as airtight as possible so you don't get air leaking into the condenser, which would increase the pressure and thereby increase the temperature inside the condenser. Uh, and then this second bullet point is also true. It's another secondary reason why we want to decrease the pressure in the condenser. Because if we decrease the pressure in the condenser, that gives the steam more room to expand and do more work. As it's expanding, you know, it's moving and it's doing work. So another reason for this is to give the steam more room to expand and do more work. But again, that's a secondary reason. All right, so once again, here is a phase diagram. We have water and steam over here and ice over here. And now we're interested in the transition between steam and water, right? So if we're right here and we have steam and we're at atmospheric pressure, then when we condense that, we're going to be right here. And the condensation temperature is the same as the boiling temperature. It's 100 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressure. But now what happens if we decrease the pressure inside the condenser? We move down this way along this, this line, this curve right here. So now this is a lower pressure. And if we're at a lower pressure, then as I condense from steam into liquid, we can draw a vertical line down here and we see that happens at a lower temperature. So as we decrease the pressure, the boiling and condensation happens at a lower temperature, just like we talked about with, uh, with you know, cooking something in Denver, same idea. So we're condensing it now, going from steam to liquid. And if we decrease the pressure, that happens at a lower temperature, which is good if we want a low T cold, and we do, to increase the Carnot efficiency. All right, so hopefully all that, that, uh, that rationale, hopefully that all, all made sense. All right. all right, so that's how we operate with a higher T hot and a lower T cold. We do that by increasing the pressure in the boiler and the steam system. That'll give us a higher T hot. And we operate at a reduced pressure, like actually a vacuum, lower than atmospheric pressure in the condenser. And we do that by using air ejectors to pump the air out of the condenser. You might ask, how do we get the boiler and steam system at a higher pressure? Mainly that's the job of the feed pumps. You know, those pumps that are pumping the condensate, the water, from the condenser back into the boiler. Mainly it's those feed pumps 
that are responsible for increasing the pressure and pumping that water back into the boiler. The next thing I want to do is I want to show you a video, and this video might seem kind of random and non sequitur, but it's really not. Um, this video, it's actually really appropriate for this time of year because this was a Super Bowl commercial a couple of years ago. And it just so happened that a couple of years ago at around this time, I was thinking about these same topics in Tech 259. And I happened to see this commercial as I was watching the Super Bowl. So I guess the Super Bowl was a little bit earlier that year or, you know, the schedule is a little bit different. Anyway, I saw this commercial as I was watching the Super Bowl and I thought, oh, that is a pretty neat video that I should show in Tech 259. So I'm going to show you this video. Most of the video commercial doesn't really relate to what we're talking about, but a little bit does. And as you're watching the video, uh, see if you can figure out what part of the video applies to what we're talking about right now in this class session. So let me share my screen. It is a Budweiser commercial, so don't take that to mean that I'm condoning it. Uh, it just happens to say something that, uh, or show something that I want to show in this class. So let me make this full screen. And I wish it had captions, closed captions, but it doesn't. So hopefully you can, you can hear what they're saying. You don't look like you're from around here. I want to prove the other. Welcome to America. We don't want to hear it. All right, so in case you couldn't tell, that was a, a story, probably an idealized story, but that was a story of Adolphus Busch uh, as an immigrant from Germany. Uh, he came apparently to the US and uh, he got on a steamboat, which was certainly steam powered in that day in the 1800s. And he went up the Mississippi River and what happened to the steamboat? Uh, the steamboat that was steam powered, it exploded. All right, so this was kind of in the middle of the development of the steam engine. And there were a lot of problems with the development of the steam engine. Why? Because they're trying to improve the efficiency of the steam engine. They're doing that, like we just talked about, by increasing the pressure of the boiler and the steam system, and also decreasing the pressure of the condenser. But increasing the pressure of something is really difficult. Uh, and there's a lot of big forces at play when you're talking about a steam system that's designed for 600 PSI or 1,000 PSI, that's a lot of pressure and pressure vessels can be very dangerous. So that's really what I wanted to show out of that video. Um, it was just kind of cool that it was a Super Bowl commercial and it happened to show a steam system from the 1800s exploding, which was a big problem for the exact reasons that we just talked about because we're trying to increase the pressure of the steam system. So I have a few more things to show about that uh, when I switch back to my slides here. As it turns out, steamboat explosions were a big, big problem, especially in the 1800s. And that was right about the time when they were trying to make these improvements to the steam systems, especially on these steam ships. And they were doing that by increasing the pressure of the boiler and the steam systems. And that led to a lot of explosions. It's really easy to find these pictures or paintings. Now, all you gotta do is go on Google and do an image search on steam boat explosions. And there were lots and lo thousands of them in the 1800s. And a lot of them resulted in, in deaths. And so there's been a lot of regulations and policies that have come about because of this that have regulated the design of steam systems. We'll talk about a few of those at the end here. 
So here's one uh, called the Moselle. It exploded in uh, 1838 near Cincinnati, and there were almost 200 people that died because of this one. Here is another one called the Princess. That was a little bit later in 1859. That was near Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That one had almost 70 casualties. And this one was probably the worst one, um, the worst steamboat explosion uh, in, in the US. It was in 1865. So think of like Civil War soldiers coming home from the war. That was, that was actually a lot of these. Um, this boat was really overloaded. It was designed for, as I recall, about uh, maybe 300 people. And on the, time, on, the, on the night that it exploded, there were uh, over 2,000 people. So this steamship was really overloaded, which contributed to all the casualties. It didn't contribute probably to why it exploded, but um, they made it a lot worse because there were a lot more people on it and it made rescue a lot more challenging. So this happened uh, in 1865 near Memphis, Tennessee. Um, most of the boilers exploded and it happened because of pressures that were too high in the steam system. And over a thousand people died in, in this steamship explosion. So this was uh, one of the worst ones, if not the worst one. But those weren't the only ones. Here are a couple more. Uh, the Helen McGregor in the early 1800s. The Oronoco is this one right here. That was a little bit smaller ship. Uh, here's another one that doesn't really say what it was, but it's another depiction of a steamship exploding and catching fire. And almost all of these caught fire and exploded for the same reason. It was because the steam system was not up to the task of handling that really high pressure. So when we increase the pressure, that's good for the efficiency of the steam system, which makes for, you know, like we talked about before, more power output for the same amount of thermal input, or you can get half of the amount of thermal input, like half the fuel for the same amount of work output. But you gotta be really careful um, because it's really dangerous to have high pressure systems. Things can explode. And in the 1800s, people were not yet very good at building and operating high pressure systems. Here's another one that wasn't even a steamship. This was a steam locomotive, uh, but they had some of the same problems and they have some of the, the same systems because again, it's a steam cycle. It's a, it's a uh, steam system and you make it more efficient by increasing the operating pressure. So here's an example of a steam locomotive that exploded. And when it exploded, it actually picked up the locomotive and threw it on top of this other locomotive resulting in a lot of damage to both of them, I'm sure. Here's another one. Uh, this is another one that I couldn't find a date or an explanation on this, but it's some kind of a boiler. Uh, and I do like this picture because you can see all of these openings. They're like holes in the side of this boiler right here. This would be the openings for the tubes to go through the boiler with the hot water or whatever it is, the hot fluid that's gonna boil the water in the boiler. So this whole thing is the boiler right here. There'd be water inside here. And then there would be really hot tubes that would be going through the boiler, depending on what type of boiler it is. And that really hot fluid going through these tubes is what actually transfers the heat to boil the water in the condenser. So this is very similar to the way a condenser works, except in a condenser, you have cold fluid going through these tubes to condense the steam coming into the condenser. All right, so we had lots and lots of steam plant explosions in the 1800s and even into the 1900s. And here is a plot of the number of boiler explosions just in the US by year. And so this graph starts at 1880, and you can see the number of steam explosions per year peaked probably somewhere a little bit after 1900, looks like between 1900 and 1910. And then they decreased as the regulations got tougher. And on the next slide, I'll show you some of those regulations. But 
Uh, it's interesting to note that the steam plant explosions were decreasing at the same time that the steam pressure, the average steam pressure of the systems was actually increasing. And I don't really, I don't agree with the end of this curve right here. Uh, it would be very unusual for a modern steam plant to have a pressure of 5,000 PSI. That's really, really high. Um, from what I have seen, uh, pretty typical pressures for a steam plant are a couple of thousand PSI, maybe up to two or 3,000 PSI. But that is, that is about as high of a steam plant pressure as I have seen. I've never seen, a, seen or heard of a steam plant operating up here at 5,000 PSI. But it is generally true that the steam pressure was increasing at the same time as we were getting better control over the steam plant systems and the number of steam plant explosions was decreasing. But nowadays, a thousand PSI to a couple thousand PSI, two or three thousand PSI, that would be pretty normal for a modern steam plant system. So how have we improved boiler safety over the past 150 years? A lot of these things make, have made a big difference. Uh, number one, just the material. The quality of the steel is much, much better now. You know, we, we have things like microscopes to inspect steel. We have uh, ultrasonic inspection that works kind of like the ultrasound used to look at infant babies inside the mother's womb. We can use that same technology to look inside steel and inspect for voids or inclusions of impurities or something inside the steel. So that's called non-destructive testing. So we have better materials. We have better ways of inspecting those materials. We have better ways of fastening those materials together, like in a boiler. Uh, we use welding now, whereas welding didn't exist in the early to mid 1800s. They were all riveted together. Um, this reminds me of the Titanic too. Part of the reason, part of the reason why the Titanic sunk was because of poor quality steel and the fact that they were riveted together instead of welded together with modern manufacturing techniques. So same thing applies to boiler and steam system design. Also, we inspect the systems more frequently. Oh, I mentioned this already, the NDT, non-destructive testing. So we can actually look inside of a piece of steel or a steel uh, weld or a connection, and we can see the quality of that connection without damaging that connection. We don't actually have to cut it apart to look inside of it anymore. Uh, government regulations, uh, a lot of, a lot of, it's a kind of a state by state policy, but uh, there are a lot of state regulations on the design and operation of steam plant systems, as well as industry groups. Uh, ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. ASTM is the American Society for Testing and Materials. And both of these have whole chapters, whole sections in their regulations on boiler systems. So they have to meet certain requirements uh, in order to um, successfully meet the regulations by these groups. And generally speaking, the government regulators won't approve the design of a system unless it is designed to specifications set by these groups. All right, so that wraps up the new material for today. I think this is kind of a fun day. I think it's pretty interesting. We talked about uh, briefly the evolution of the steam engine, how the new common or atmospheric steam engine worked, and then the improvements made by James Watt in the Watt steam engine. And then we talked in general, how do you improve the efficiency of a steam engine? We talked about what you can do to tea hot and tea cold to improve the efficiency of the steam engine. And probably more importantly, we talked about how do you do that? Uh, great to know that we can improve the efficiency by increasing T-hot, but how do you do that in a real steam engine? Likewise, how do you decrease T-cold in a steam engine? And then we talked about some of the you know, downsides or precautions that you need to take uh, when you do that. And uh, some of the improvements that have been made over the past 150 years to allow for improvements that improve the efficiency of the steam engine. All right, so that's kind of in a nutshell what we talked about today. 
Uh, like most days, I will end the class by talking briefly about the next homework assignment. So we do have problem set number five that will be due at 10 a.m. at our next class session. So let's talk through that real quickly. I'll switch over to the document camera. All right, here is problem set number five on page five of the lab manual. Two problems. Uh, the first one says we've got this heat engine with this diagram right here where we have a high temperature reservoir and then a heat engine process that's taking place and then a cold temperature reservoir. And it says it has a thermal efficiency of 25%. So notice that doesn't say that it has a Carnot efficiency of 25%. It doesn't say that it's ideal or frictionless or anything. It says that it has a thermal efficiency of 25%. So it's operating with an actual efficiency of 25%. And it has a steady power output of 900 kilowatts. What's the output? Well, that's, that's this. That's our work right here. So this is 900 kilowatts. It also might be worth remembering, what is a watt? One watt equals one joule per second. Remember that definition. That will probably be helpful for you in this problem. And we want to calculate the fuel flow rate, the amount of fuel going into the combustion chamber in kilograms per second if the fuel is wood with an energy content of 15 megajoules per kilogram. All right, so let me go back to what I tried to emphasize earlier. The operating efficiency of this system is 25%. So we're not going to use the Carnot efficiency here because the Carnot efficiency is the maximum theoretical efficiency if it was frictionless and ideal and no heat transfer and reversible, you know, all that good stuff. So we're not going to use Carnot efficiency here. That just doesn't apply here. If we did calculate the Carnot efficiency, the Carnot efficiency would definitely be higher than 25% because the Carnot efficiency is the maximum theoretical efficiency, and this says that it's actually operating at 25% efficiency. So we need to use a different expression for efficiency. And if you remember from uh, the class ago or so, we introduced this, and we said that the actual operating efficiency of a process is equal to what do you get out of it that's useful? In this case, it's the work output compared to what do you have to put into it? And in this case, it's Q in, all right? So this is the applicable expression that you're gonna wanna use here. The efficiency is equal to the work output divided by the heat input, all right? And in this case, we are given the actual operating efficiency here, and we're given the amount of work output, all right? So you might have to do a little bit of conversion here because this is in a unit of power, right? So you might have to convert uh, a little bit uh, here to get in some compatible terms. But we're given what the work output is. It's 900 kilowatts or 900 joules per second. And what we're gonna try to find is this. Q in is the only unknown in this equation. So you need to rearrange this equation a little bit, probably do a little bit of unit conversion to make all the units work out because we wanna know how many kilograms per second of wood is being fed into this process in order to provide this amount of heat input. So what is that? What is that heat input, all right? So that's uh, a pretty big hint, I think, on number one. Um, both of these are some big hints. And then in number two, oh, this one is pretty straightforward. Calculate the maximum possible efficiency for an ideal frictionless heat engine. Well, we've been talking about that for most of the day today, and we've talked about it in previous classes as well. So what type of efficiency is this? What is the maximum theoretical efficiency? It's the Carnot efficiency, right? So we have an equation for that, and this is just plug and chug. You just have to uh, plug and chug the numbers. But there is one thing that if I didn't tell you this right now, I bet some of you might make a mistake. What temperature scale do we need to use when we plug in our temperatures to 
the equation for Carnot efficiency. All right, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you, but I want you to think about that. What units are we given here in what temperature scale and what temperature scale do we need to use when we plug in our values to the equation for Carnot efficiency? All right, be careful with that. That's kind of the only tricky thing with that problem. Otherwise, it's pretty much plug and chug. So I think those are some pretty good hints on problem set number five. Problem set number five is due at 10 a.m. Uh, on our next class session. So the day of our next class session. So don't forget about that. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, you can reach me by email. It's probably the best way we can set something up. Happy to help out if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Have a good week.